Welcome back. Thank you for choosing to be with me today as we uh, continue our discussion through through Romans. And I know last time we were here that I that I said we would get into Romans eight, but uh, well, and 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 hopefully we will a little bit. But before we dive into Romans eight, I want to. You know, there's this there's this thing of context that we have to deal with, and and Romans eight is one of my favorite chapters of of the entire Bible. I mean, you could Romans eight has so much good stuff in it, uh, but Romans eight does not exist within itself. Romans eight exists within. The, you know, the section of Romans that is Romans five through eight, which exists within the section of Romans, which is one to sixteen, which exists within the New Testament, which exists within the Bible, which exists within the entire story of of God and man, and this relationship that we have with Him. And so, Paul, when he's talking in, in Romans, there is a greater narrative that he is dealing with than just a few things that, that, that are spoken of in Romans 8. And so, I want to have a little story time today. Uh, and I want to... You know, I tell a little bit of the story and what has been going on to set the stage for this great chapter. And to start with, we have to start in the beginning. And in the beginning, over in Genesis, God speaks things into existence. He looks out onto whatever he was looking out over and decides through the expression of his own character, he has to create. He has to make something to share in who he is. And so he makes heaven and earth. And he makes light and dark. And he makes sea and land on the earth. And then he makes plants and animals. And he makes man in his own image. He gives man this this particular place that of all of creation man is going to be the image bearer of God. Let us make man in our own image God says. And he places man in the garden. And the garden is, is kind of like uh, we have a house, right? You may have a house. I have a house. We have a place that we go from to do things. But at the end of our day, we come home. And this place is our place. And it's the place where we have family, where we have things set up the way that we want them to be set up uh, so that we can, in the best moments, relax and be and, and let our guard down. And here is this garden where 
God walks in the cool of the day with his image bearer. And he gives those image bearers a, a task to do. And he says, I want you to be fruitful. I want you to multiply. I want you to fill the earth. I want you to go forth from this place, this garden, and I want you to take who I am, which is shown in you, and I want you to spread that around. And he says, I want you to have dominion. I'll give you a special place over all of creation that you are to have dominion over the birds, over the animals, over the fish of the sea. You have a position of authority and dominion over everything. And it's not a dominion like we see, a broken dominion, like this, ah, this king who everyone's got to do what they... No, that's not the kind of dominion that we're talking about. We're talking about this dominion that is a creating. It is, it is a dominion that is evidenced by the dominion of God. Because we are now his image bearers. And so God... And his dominion is flowing through us into creation. And he says, this is who I want you to be. There is this perfect blend of God with man in creation. And it's extended And that's, and that's this beautiful setting to the beginning of a story. And we only get it. We only get it in two chapters. Genesis 1 and 2. We only, we only get it uh, in this, uh, this tiny glimpse of this perfection, of this great balance. Because by the time chapter 3 comes along, Satan enters the tempter the devil the serpent comes in and starts to throw the character of god uh, throw some shadow on the character of god he doesn't really tell you the truth he has good stuff that he's not giving you And so Eve listens to the serpent. And she and Adam uh, choose to go their own way. And when they do, God sends them out of his presence. He sends them out of the, of the garden. And, and I want you, and, and it's not just man that bears the burden of sin. Because God placed man in dominion over all the animals and the earth to be his image bearer there in creation. And so when, when God says the curse to Adam, he says, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, but thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you'll eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. You see, see God created us 
as his image in the world. And when we fail, whenever we failed to do that, it wasn't just man that bore the curse. Everything under man bore the curse. And in the, and in the, the curse that God uh, laid on the, the woman, on Eve, or rather not on Eve, but on, on Satan, the one that is tempted, the one who, who drew these people away from their, from their beautiful purpose of being the image bearers of God, he says, I will put enmity or strife or war between the woman and you. So humankind now has this struggle that it's going to engage in with Satan. With, with, with Satan and temptation and sin and death that came from it, right? There's now going to be this struggle. But he said, but God says to Satan, there's going to be the struggle between your seed and her seed singular but that seed will bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel so if you can imagine a snake crawling on the ground and someone a man stepping on the head of that snake it might hurt their heel a little bit delivering that fatal blow but it's going gonna, it's gonna to destroy that, that serpent. And so God, God says to, that here is this problem that's going to exist. Not just with you, but with all of creation because of what you did. However, there's going to come a time when I'm going to deal with it. And, and so from, from chapter 3 down through chapter 11, we see this degrading cycle of man's wickedness, of our, of our failing. So much so by chapter 6 that God wipes out the earth in a flood, starts it all over afresh, And then, and then immediately it happens again. It starts on its way. And by chapter 11, men are gathering in their rebellion at the Tower of Babel. And God uh, sends them off in ways. But then, but then chapter 12, God sees this man, Abraham. This is a man that believed God. He believed in God, and he believed God would do what he said he would do. And, and as you read the story of Abraham, and I encourage you to do so, because the book of Romans is about the story of Abraham. And Abraham believed in God. Abraham believed that what God said he would do, he would do. And because of that, God credits that to Abram, later called Abraham, credits that as righteousness to him. He says, you know what? I know that sometimes you fail in being my image bearer. Sometimes you don't do what you should do. But because you believe I'm going to make things right, because you trust in me, I'm going to take care of you. Now, we don't see how he's going to take care of him. We don't see how he's going to do that. But God gives him three promises. He says, I'm going to give you a great people. I'm going to give you a land. So, so 
understand, now, just like Adam had a place in the garden, this great people are going to have a place that's tied to the land, that's tied to, to creation. There is a promise regarding creation. And he says, and I'm going to bless all nations through you. So you are going to become a great people that is going to be tied to creation. And everyone in the world will be blessed through you. And then we see, and, and we see through the story, the narrative through Genesis, we see that, that um, this lineage of Abraham, then, then Isaac, then Jacob, and then Jacob's sons, and all the mess that goes on there in the end of Genesis, they end up in captivity in Egypt. They become this great numerous people that are enslaved, that are living in death under a harsh king. And God comes in, shows his great power, and pulls them out of that to himself, makes them a promise that you are going to be my special people. You are going to be those that that I have brought together, that you are going to now be my light to the rest of the world. And then we continue on in the story, and we see that they really don't do a great job of that. But God still is living with them. God still is living with them. His temple is right there in Jerusalem, and they come to worship. And, and they, well... They sometimes come to worship. And, and then in the times whenever they worship other things, it, it frustrates God and he brings down some, some um, consequences on them for their going astray. And there's this struggle that keeps going on and keeps going on and keeps going on. But God's still faithful to his promise that I'm going to make all things right. And I'm going to do it through the seed of Abraham, through this people that will be a blessing to the entire world. Somehow it's going to happen. And we don't see it because they're not really doing it. And then you get to the end of, of the Old Testament. And it's like, it's like the story doesn't come to a conclusion. Because these people are, are taken off into captivity and they're brought back. And even then... It's not the same. Even then, the, the, the prophets that, that speak after the New Testament, or, or excuse me, the prophets that speak after the return from the exile say, the day of the Lord is going to come. It's going to come. God's going to come back to us. Sometime. And then... You don't really hear anything until the story of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus comes, God with us. And I want to read for you again Romans chapter 1. Because after Jesus lives and he dies and he is resurrected he sends out special people called apostles with a message and listen to Romans 1 starting in verses 1 and following Paul a bondservant of Christ Jesus called as an apostle set apart for the good news of God which he promised beforehand through his promise through his prophets and the holy scriptures concerning his son who was born a descendant of david according to the flesh 
who is declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through him we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. Romans is this end look at the promises of God. And he says down in verse 17 that the gospel, this promise of good news coming, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it, for in it, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, righteousness of God is revealed. It's shown to us that God, God will keep His promises. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the righteous man shall live by faith. So you look at these people who are been who have been believing in God. And they're following him. It shows now when we look at the story of the people that keep going regardless of the struggle. We keep looking back to God and saying he's going to do what he promises. We believe Him, and we believe in Him. And God proves it when He resurrects Jesus from the dead. That He's got it under control. He's going to rescue us. My time's up for now. But we'll get more into it, I promise, next week. Thank you very much for being here. In the narrative of God's rescuing through the nation of Israel, rescuing the world. What we have at one point is when they're in captivity, God tells them in the final curse that he's going to place on Egypt, that he's going to save them, but he'll do it if they take a lamb, an unblemished lamb, and paint blood over their door. And uh, the, the death angel, as it is commonly re referred to, passes over Egypt. It's going to enter in all of the houses and kill the firstborn, except those that have the blood on the lintel. It's going to pass over those. And, and later on, God says, I want you... To, to make a celebration of this moment. In the moment when you are set free, you are going to have a celebration in which you remember what I did for you. And after Jesus comes, he sits down at that Passover feast with his disciples, wanting to eat with them, and he takes it and he changes a portion of it. And he takes a, a, a bread, and he says, This bread is my body, given for you. Every time you eat of it, you remember me. And he takes a cup of, of the wine and he says, this cup is a new covenant 
It's a symbol of something, of a new promise that is going to be for your forgiveness. So that as you are forgiven, you know that it's my blood that does it. And it's for you. And every time you drink it, I want you to remember me. And even though we don't have the, the Passover celebration, uh, and, and we as Gentiles, is not really, that's not our, our, our culture, it's not necessarily our heritage. But I can imagine every time the Jewish Christians had a Passover feast afterwards, they, they remember exactly what Jesus said in a context that he said it. But what has come to now for us is these two emblems, this bread and this cup, are still enduring for you and me to remember what Jesus did for us. On the night when he set us free, not from the slavery of Egypt, but from the slavery of sin. He sets us free and he gives us the promise of forgiveness of sin and, and that he's going to be with us. And so we take that now, remembering him and what he did for us. Please pray with me over the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your miraculous plan and your heart that, that you seek to rescue us, that you seek to save us, that you seek to give us life, even though uh, we seem sometimes bound and determined to go against you. And we thank you for the cost that you are willing to pay for us. And we pray now that as we take of this bread, that you would uh, bless it and bless our memories to be reminded of what Jesus did in his body for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Now let us pray again for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much yet again for this cup, this blood, this blood that is based on a promise that you will forgive our sins. And we know that you are faithful. We know that you are righteous. We believe you and we trust you. And as we take this cup, Please bless it to our remembrance that we could that we could remember Jesus' blood and that it forgives us and helps set us free from the bondage of sin. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Romans 8, starting in verse 37, it says, But in all these things we, are over, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He has a, an unshakable pursuit in his love for you. And he will never let go. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're going to go through this week, I pray that you rest in the 
unshakable, solid love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God be with you.